Section 11 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 9, European Statesmen, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chateaubriand, Part 1. 1768 to 1848, The Restoration and Fall of the Bourbons. In this lecture I wish to treat of the restoration of the Bourbons and of the counter-revolution in France. On the fall of Napoleon, the Prussian king and the Austrian emperor, under the predominating influence of Metternich, in restoring their Bourbons, were adverse to constitutional checks. They wanted nothing less than absolute monarchy such as existed before the revolution. On the other hand, the Tsar Alexander, generous and inclined then to liberal ideas, was willing to concede something to the revolution, while the government of England, mindful of the liberty which had made that country so glorious and so prosperous, also favored a constitutional government in the person of the legitimate heir of the French monarchy. Such was also the wish of the French nation so far as it could be expressed, for the French people, under whatever form of government they may have lived, have never forgotten or repudiated the ideas and bequests of the greatest movement in modern times. Prussia and Austria, therefore, were obliged to yield to Russia and England, supported by the will of the French nation itself. Russia had no jealousy of French ideas, and England certainly could not, consistently with her struggles and her traditions, oppose what the English nation resolutely clung to, and of which it was so proud. Prussia and Austria, undisturbed by revolutions, wished simply the restoration of the status quo, which with them meant absolute monarchy, but which in France was not really the status quo, since the revolution had effected great and permanent changes even under the regime of Bonaparte. Russia and England, in conceding something to liberty, were yet as earnest and sincere advocates of legitimacy as Prussia and Austria, for constitutional rights may exist under a monarchy as well as under a republic. Moreover, it was felt by enlightened statesmen of all parties that no government could be stable and permanent in France which ignored the bequests of the revolution, which even Napoleon professed to respect. Accordingly, it was settled that Louis the Eighteenth, the younger brother of Louis the Sixteenth, who had fled from France in 1792, should be recalled from exile, and restored to the throne of his ancestors, since he agreed to accept checks to his authority and swore to defend the new constitution, although he insisted upon reigning by the grace of God, not as a monarch who received his crown from the people, or as a gift from other monarchs, but by divine right. To this all parties consented. He maintained the dignity of the royal prerogative at the same time that he recognized the essential liberties of the nation. They were not so full and complete as those in England, but the king guaranteed to secure the rights of both public and private property, to respect the freedom of the press, to grant liberty of worship, to maintain the national obligations, to make the judicial power independent and irremovable, and to admit all French men to civil and military employment without restrictions in matters of religion. These in substance constituted the charter which he granted on condition of reigning, an immense gain to France and the cause of civilization, if honestly maintained. Louis the Eighteenth was neither a great king nor a great man, but his long exile of twenty years, his travels and residences in various countries in Europe, his misfortunes and his studies, had liberalized his mind without embittering his heart. He never lost his dignity or his hopes in his sad reverses, and when he was thus recalled to France to mount the throne of his murdered brother, he was a very respectable man, both from natural intelligence and extensive attainments. He possessed great social conversational powers, was moderate in his views of Catholicism, virtuous in his private character, affectionate with his friends and in the members of his family, prudent in the exercise of power, and disposed to reign according to the constitution which he honestly had accepted but socially he restored the ancient order of things, surrounded himself with a splendid court, lived in great pomp and ceremony, and appointed the ancient nobles to the higher offices of state. According to French writers, he was the equal in conversation of any of the great men with whom he was brought in contact, without being great himself, thereby resembling Louis the Fourteenth. He had handsome features, a musical voice, pleasing manners, and singular urbanity, without being condescending. He was infirm in his legs, which prevented him from taking exercise, except in his long daily drives, drawn in his magnificent carriage by eight horses, without riders and guards. The king delegated his powers to no single statesman, but held the reins in his own hand. 
his ability as a ruler consisted in his tact and moderation in managing the conflicting parties and in his honest abstention from encroaching on the liberties of the people in rare emergencies so that his reign was peaceable and tolerably successful it required no inconsiderable ability to preserve the throne to his successor amid such a war of factions and such a disposition for encroachments on the part of the royal family in contrast with the splendid achievements and immense personality of napoleon louis the eighteenth is not a great figure in history but had there been no revolution and no napoleon he would have left the fame of a wise and benevolent sovereign his only striking weakness was in submitting to the influence of either a favorite or a woman like all the bourbons from henry the fourth downward except perhaps louis the sixteenth who would have been more fortunate had he yielded implicitly to the overpowering ascendancy of such a woman as madame de maintenon or such a minister as richelieu the reign of louis the eighteenth is not marked by great events or great passions except the unrelenting and bitter animosity of the royalists to everything which characterized the revolution or the military ascendancy of napoleon by their incessant intrigues and unbounded hatreds and intolerant bigotry they kept the kingdom in constant turmoils even to the verge of revolution gradually pushing the king into impolitic measures against his will and his better judgment and creating reaction to all liberal movements these turmoils which are uninteresting to us form no inconsiderable part of the history of the times the only great event of the reign was the war in spain to suppress revolutionary ideas in that miserable country ground down by priests and royal despotism and a prey to every conceivable faction the ministry which the king appointed on his accession was composed of able moderate and honest men but without any ascendant genius except talleyrand who selected his colleagues and retained for himself the portfolio of foreign affairs and the presidency of the council giving to fauche the management of internal affairs loath was the king to accept the services of either the one a regicide and the other a traitor the whole royal family set up a howl of indignation at the appointment of fauche but it was deemed necessary to secure his services in order to maintain law and order and the king remained firm against the earnest expostulations of his brother the comte d'artois his niece the duchesse d'anglomé and all the royalists who had influence with him but he despised and hated in his soul fauche that minion of napoleon that product of blood and treason and waited only for a convenient time to banish him from the councils and the realm nor did he like talleyrand at that time the greatest man in france but made use of his magnificent talent only until he could do without him when the king felt established on his throne he sent talleyrand away indeed there was great pressure brought to bear for the dismissal by those who found the minister too moderate in his views the king did not punish him but kept him in a subordinate office leaving him to enjoy his dignities and the immense fortune he had accumulated talleyrand was born in seventeen fifty four and belonged to one of the most illustrious families in france he was destined to the church against his will being from the start worldly ambitious and scandalously immoral but he accepted his destiny and soon distinguished himself at the sorbonne for his literary attainments for his wit and his social qualities at twenty as the young abbe de perigord he was received into the highest society of paris his noble birth his aristocratic and courtly manners his convivial qualities and his irrepressible wit made him a favorite in the gay circles which marked the early part of the reign of louis the sixteenth while his extraordinary abilities and consummate tact naturally secured early promotion in seventeen eighty he was appointed to the office of general agent for the clergy of france which brought him before the public eight years after at the early age of thirty-four he was made bishop of altoun in may seventeen eighty nine he became a member of the states general and with his fascinating eloquence tried to induce the clergy to surrender their tithes and church lands to the nation a result which was brought about soon after nolens volens by the genius of mirabeau talleyrand hated the church and despised the people but like mirabeau was in favor of a constitution like that of england in all his changes he remained an aristocrat from his tastes his education and his rank but veiled his views whatever they were with profound dissimulation of which he was a consummate master the laxity of his morals the secret hatred of his order and his infidel sentiments led to his excommunication which troubled him but little out of the pale of the church he turned his thoughts to diplomacy and was sent to london as an ambassador without however the official title and insignia of that high office 
where he fascinated the highest circles by the splendor of his conversation and the causticity of his wit on his return to paris he was distrusted by the jacobins and with difficulty made his escape to england but the english government also distrusted a man of such boundless intrigue and ordered him to quit the country within twenty-four hours he fled to america at the age of forty with straitened means but after the close of the reign of terror returned to paris and six months later was made foreign minister under the directory this office he did not long retain failing to secure the confidence of the government the austere carnot said of him that man brings with him all the vices of the old regime without being able to acquire a single virtue of the new one he possesses no fixed principles but changes them as he does his linen adopting them according to the fashion of the day he was a philosopher when philosophy was in vogue a republican now because it is necessary at present to be so in order to become anything to-morrow he would proclaim and uphold tyranny if he could thereby serve his own interests i will not have him at any price so long as i am at the helm of the state he shall be nothing when bonaparte returned from egypt citizen talleyrand had been six months out of office and he saw that it would be for his interest to put himself in intimate connection with the most powerful man in france besides as a diplomatist he saw that only in a monarchical government could he have employment napoleon who seldom made a mistake in his estimate of character perceived that talleyrand was just the man for his purpose talented dexterous unscrupulous and sagacious and made him his minister of foreign affairs utterly indifferent as to his private character nor could he politically have made a wiser choice for it was talleyrand who made the concordat with the pope the treaty of luneville and the peace of amiens napoleon wanted a practical man in the diplomatic post neither was a pedant nor an idealist and that was just what talleyrand was a man to meet emergencies a man to build up a throne but even napoleon got tired of him at last and talleyrand retired with the dignity of vice grand elector of the empire grand chamberlain and prince of benevento together with a fortune it is said of thirty million francs how did you acquire your riches blandly asked the emperor one day in the simplest way in the world replied the ex-minister i bought stock the day before the eighteenth brumaire when napoleon overthrew the directory and sold it again the day after when napoleon meditated the conquest of spain talleyrand like metternich saw that it would be a blunder and frankly told the emperor his opinion a thing greatly to his credit but his advice enraged napoleon who could brook no opposition or dissent and he was turned out of his office as chamberlain talleyrand avenged himself by plotting against his sovereign foreseeing his fall and betraying him to the bourbons he gave his support to louis the eighteenth because he saw that the only government then possible for france was one combining legitimacy with constitutional checks for talleyrand with all his changes and treasons liked neither an unfettered despotism nor democratic rule as one of those who acted with the revolutionists he was liberal in his ideas but as the servant of royalty he wished to see a firmly established government which to his mind was impossible with the reign of demagogues when the congress of vienna was assembled he was sent to it as the french plenipotentiary and he did good work at the congress for his sovereign whose representative he was and for his country by contriving with his adroit manipulations to alienate the northern from the southern states of germany making the latter allies of france and the former allies of russia in other words practically dividing germany which it was the work of bismarck afterward to unite a united germany talleyrand regarded as threatening to the interest of france and he contrived to bring france back again into political importance to restore her rank among the great powers he did not bargain for spoils like the other plenipotentiaries he only strove to preserve the nationality of france and to secure her ancient limits which prussia in her greed and hatred would have destroyed or impaired but for the magnanimity of the czar alexander and the firmness of lord castlereagh on his return from the congress of vienna the reign of talleyrand as prime minister was short and as his power was comparatively small under both louis the eighteenth and his successor charles the tenth and as he was not the representative of a reactionary idea or movements but only of a firm government i do not give to him the leadership of the counter-revolution he was unquestionably the greatest statesman at that time in france though indolent careless and without power as an orator who was then the great exponent of reaction and of antagonism to liberal and progressive opinions during the reigns of the restored bourbons it was not the king himself louis the eighteenth 
for he did all he could to repress the fanatical zeal of his family and of the royalist party he despised the feeble mind of his brother the comte de artois his narrow intolerance and his court of priests and bigots and was in perpetual conflict with him as a politician while at the same time he clung to him with the ties of natural affection was it the duc de richelieu grand nephew of the great cardinal whom the king selected for his prime minister on the retirement of talleyrand he hardly represents the return to absolutism since he was moderate conciliatory and disposed to unite all parties under a constitutional government no man in france was more respected than he adored by his family modest virtuous disinterested and patriotic as an administrator in the service of russia during the ascendancy of napoleon he had greatly distinguished himself he was a favorite of alexander and through his influence with the czar france was in no slight degree indebted for the favorable terms which she received on the restoration of the monarchy when prussia exacted a cruel indemnity he wished to unite all parties in loyal submission to the constitution rather than secure the ascendancy while able and highly respected richelieu was not preeminently great nor was villele who succeeded him as prime minister and who retained his power for six or eight years nearly to the close of the reign of charles x a great historical figure the man under the restored monarchy who represented with the most ability reactionary movements of all kinds and devotion to the cause of absolute monarchy i think was francois auguste vicomte de chateaubriand certainly he was the most illustrious character of that period poet order diplomatist minister he was a man of genius who stands out as a great figure in history not so great as talleyrand in the single department of diplomacy but an infinitely more respectable and many-sided man he had an immense eclat in the early part of this century as writer and poet although his literary fame has now greatly declined lamartine in his sentimental and rhetorical exaggeration speaks of him as the ossian of france an aeolian harp producing sounds which ravish the ear and agitate the heart but which the mind cannot define the poet of instincts rather than of ideas who gained an immortal empire not over the reason but over the imagination of the age chateaubriand was born in brittany of a noble but not illustrious family in seventeen sixty nine entered the army in seventeen eighty six and during the reign of terror emigrated to america he returned to france in seventeen ninety nine after the eighteenth brumaire and became a contributor to the mercure de france in eighteen o two he published the genie du christianisme which made him enthusiastically admired as a literary man the only man of the time who could compete with the fame of madame de stal this book astonished a country that had been led astray by an infidel philosophy and converted it back to christianity not by force of arguments but by an appeal to the heart and the imagination the clergy the aristocracy women and youth were alike enchanted the author was sent to rome by napoleon as secretary of his embassy but on the murder of the du de hein eighteen o four chateaubriand left the imperial service and lived in retirement traveling to the holy land and throughout the orient and southern europe and writing his books of travels he took no interest in political affairs until the time of the restoration when he again appeared a brilliant and effective pamphlet de bonaparte et de bourbons published by him in eighteen fourteen was said by louis the eighteenth to be worth an army of a hundred thousand men to the cause of the bourbons and upon their re-establishment chateaubriand was immediately in high favor and was made a member of the chamber of peers the chamber of peers was substituted for the senate of napoleon and was elected by the king it had cognizance of the crime of high treason and of all attempts against the safety of the state it was composed of the most distinguished nobles the bishops and marshals of france presided over by the chancellor to this chamber the ministers were admitted as well as to the chamber of deputies the members of which were elected by about one hundred thousand voters out of thirty millions of people they were all men of property and as aristocratic as the peers themselves they began their sessions by granting prodigal compensations indemnities and endowments to the crown and to the princes they appropriated thirty-three millions of francs annually for the maintenance of the king besides voting thirty millions more for the payment of his debts they passed a law restoring to the former proprietors the lands alienated to the state and still unsold they brought to punishment the generals who had deserted to napoleon during the one hundred days of his renewed reign they manifested the most intense hostility to the regime which he had established 
indeed all classes joined in the chorus against the fallen emperor and attributed to him alone the misfortunes of france vengeance not now directed at royalists but against republicans was the universal cry the people demanded the heads of those who had been their idols everything like admiration for napoleon seemed to have passed away for ever the violence of the royalists for speedy vengeance on their old foes surpassed the cries of the revolutionists in the reign of terror france was again convulsed with passions which especially raged in the bosoms of the royalists they shot marshal ney the bravest of the brave and colonel labedoyen they established courts martial for political offences they passed a law against seditious cries and individual liberty there were massacres at marseilles and atrocities at nimes the catholics of the south persecuted the protestants the king himself was almost the only man among his party that was inclined to moderation and he found a bitter opposition from the members of his own family added to these discords the finances were found to be in a most disordered state and the annual deficit was fifty or sixty millions all this was taking place while one hundred and fifty thousand foreign soldiers were quartered in the towns and garrisons at the expense of the government the return of napoleon had cost the lives of sixty thousand frenchmen and a thousand million of francs besides the indemnities which amounted to fifteen hundred millions more no language of denunciation could be stronger than that which went forth from the mouth of the whole nation in view of napoleon's selfishness and ambition but one voice was listened to and that was the cry for vengeance prudence moderation and justice were alike disregarded all attempts to stem the tide of ultra royalist violence were in vain the king was obliged to dismiss talleyrand because he was not violent enough in his measures at the same time he was glad to get rid of his sagacious minister being jealous of his ascendancy so the throne of louis the eighteenth was anything but a bed of roses amid the war of parties and the perils which surrounded it all his tact was required to steer the ship of state amidst the rocks and breakers most of the troubles were centered in the mutual hostilities jealousies and hatreds of the royalists themselves at the head of whom were the king's brother the comte d'artois and the vicomte de chateaubriand so vehement were the passions of the deputies nearly all the royalists that the president of the chamber the excellent and talented lanet was publicly insulted in his chair by a violent member of the extreme right and even chateaubriand the king was obliged to deprive of his office on account of the violence of his opinions in behalf of absolutism a greater royalist than the king himself the terrible reaction was forced by the nation upon the sovereign who was more liberal and humane than the people of course in the embittered quarrels between the royalists themselves nothing was done during the reign of louis the eighteenth towards useful and needed reforms the orders in the chambers did not discuss great ideas of any kind and inaugurated no grand movements not even internal improvements the only subjects which occupied the chambers were proscriptions confiscations grants to the royal family the restoration of the clergy to their old possessions salaries to high officials the trials of state prisoners conspiracies and crimes against the government all of no sort of interest to us and of no historical importance in the meantime there assembled at verona a congress composed of nearly all the sovereigns of europe with their representatives as brilliant an assemblage as that at vienna a few years before it meant not to put down a great conqueror but to suppress revolutionary ideas and movements which were beginning to break out in various countries in europe especially in italy and spain to this congress was sent as one of the representatives of france chateaubriand who on its assembling was ambassador at london he was however weary of english life and society he did not like the climate with its interminable fogs he was not received by the higher aristocracy with the cordiality he expected and seemed to be intimate with no one but canning whose conversion to liberal views had not then taken place in france the ministry of the duc de richelieu had been succeeded by that of villel as president of the council in which m mathieu de montmorency was minister of foreign affairs member of a most illustrious house and one of the finest characters that ever adorned an exalted station between montmorency and chateaubriand there existed the most intimate and affectionate friendship and it was at the urgent solicitation of the former that chateaubriand was recalled from london and sent with montmorency to verona where he had a wider scope for his ambition end of section eleven 
Section 12 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 9, European Statesmen, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Chateaubriand, Part 2. Chateaubriand was most graciously received by the Tsar Alexander and by Metternich, the latter at that time in the height of his power and glory. Alexander flattered Chateaubriand as a hero of humanity and a religious philosopher while Metternich received him as the apostle of conservatism. The particular subject which occupied the attention of the Congress was whether the great powers should intervene in the internal affairs of Spain, then agitated by revolution. King Ferdinand, who was restored to his throne after the forced abdication of Joseph Bonaparte, had broken the Constitution of 1812, which he had sworn to defend, and outraged his subjects by cruelties equalled only by those of that other Bourbon who reigned at Naples. In consequence, his subjects had rebelled and sought to secure their liberties. This rebellion disturbed all Europe, and the great powers, with the exception of England, ruled virtually by Canning, the foreign minister, resolved on an armed intervention to suppress the popular revolution. Chateaubriand used all his influence in favor of intervention, and so did Montmorency. They even exceeded the instructions of the king and Villel, the prime minister, who wished to avoid a war with Spain. They acted as the representatives of the Holy Alliance rather than as ambassadors of France. The Congress committed Russia, Austria, and Prussia to hostile interference, in case the king of France should be driven into war, a course which Wellington disapproved and which he urged Louis the Eighteenth to refrain from. In consequence, the French king temporized, dreading either to resist or to submit to the ascendancy of Russia, and dissatisfied with the course his negotiators had taken at the Congress, especially his Minister of Foreign Affairs, on whom the responsibility lay. Montmorency accordingly resigned, and Chateaubriand took his place, in consequence of which a coolness sprung up between the two friends who at the Congress had equally advocated the same policy. The discussions which ensued in the chambers, whether or not France should embark in a war with Spain, in other words, whether she should interfere with the domestic affairs of a foreign and independent nation, were the occasion of the first serious split among the statesmen of France at this time. There was a party for war and a party against it. At the head of the latter were men who afterward became distinguished. There were bitter denunciations of the ministers, but the war party headed by Chateaubriand prevailed, and the French ambassador was recalled from Madrid, although war was not yet formally declared. In the Chamber of Peers, Talleyrand used his influence against the invasion of Spain, foretelling the evils which would ultimately result, even as he had cautioned Napoleon against the same thing. He told the Chamber that although the proposed invasion would probably be successful, it would be a great mistake. M. Mollet, afterward so eminent as an orator, took the side of Talleyrand. "'Where are we going?' said he. "'We are going to Madrid. Alas, we have been there already.' Will a revolution cease when the independence of the people who are suffering from it is threatened? Have we not the example of the French Revolution, which was invincible when its cause became identical with that of our independence? This man, exclaimed the king, confirms me in the system of M. de Villel, to temporize and avoid the war if it be possible. Chateaubriand replied in an elaborate speech in favor of the war. From his standpoint, his speech was masterly and unanswerable. It was a grand consecutive argument, solid logic without sentimentalism. While he admitted that according to the principles laid down by the great writers on international war, intervention could not generally be defended, he yet maintained that there were exceptions to the rule, and this was one of them, that the national safety was jeopardized by the Spanish Revolution, that England herself had intervened in the French Revolution, that all the interests of France were compromised by the successes of the Spanish Revolutionists that a moral contagion was spreading even among the troops themselves, in fact, that there was no security for the throne, or for the cause of religion and of public order, unless the armies of France should restore Ferdinand, then a virtual prisoner in his own palace, to the government he had inherited. The war was decided upon, and the Duke of Anglomé, nephew of the king, was sent across the Pyrenees with one hundred thousand troops to put down the innumerable factions, and reseat Ferdinand. The Duke was assisted, of course, by all the royalists of Spain, 
by all the clergy, and by all conservative parties, and the conquest of the kingdom was comparatively easy. The Republican chiefs were taken and hanged, including Diego, the ablest of them all. Ferdinand, delivered by foreign armies, remounted his throne, forgot all his pledges, and reigned on the most despotic principles, committing the most atrocious cruelties. The successful general returned to France with great eclat, while the government was pushed every day by the triumphant royalists into increased severity, into measures which logically led, under Charles X, to his expulsion from the throne, and the final defeat of the principle of the legitimacy itself another great step toward republican institutions which were finally destined to triumph among the extreme measures was the septennial bill which passed both houses against the protest of liberal members some of whom afterward became famous such as general foy general sebastini dupont de lour casimir perrier lafitte langevinay this law was a coup d'etat against electoral opinions and representative government. It gave the king and his government the advantage of fixing for seven years longer the majority which was secured by the elections of 1822, and of closing the chamber against a modification of public opinions. Villel and Chateaubriand were the authors of this act. Another bill was proposed by Villel, not so objectionable, which was to reduce the interest on the loans contracted by the state in other words to borrow money at less interest and pay off the old debts a salutary financial measure adopted in england and later by the united states after the civil war but this measure was bitterly opposed by the clergy who looked upon it as a reduction of their incomes here chateaubriand virtually abandoned the government in his uniform support of the temporalities of the church and the measure failed which so deeply exasperated both the king and the prime minister that chateaubriand was dismissed from his office as minister of foreign affairs the fallen minister angrily resented his disgrace and thenceforward secretly took part against the government embarrassing it by his articles in the journals of the day he did not renounce his conservative opinions but he became the personal enemy of villel chateaubriand had no magnanimity he retired to nurse his resentments in the society of madame recamier with whom he had formed a friendship difficult to be distinguished from love he had always been her devoted admirer when she reigned a queen of society in the fashionable salons of paris and continued his intimacy with her until his death daily did he when a broken old man make his accustomed visit to her modest apartments in the convent of saint joseph and give vent to his melancholy and morbid feelings he regarded himself as the most injured man in france he became discontented with the crown and even with the aristocracy on the day of his retirement from the ministry the intelligence of the royalist party followed him in opposition to the government whose faults he had encouraged and shared the journal des debats the most influential newspaper in france deserted Villel, and from this defection may be dated says lamartine all those enmities against the government of the restoration which collected in one work of aggression the most contradictory ideas which alienated public opinion which exasperated the government and pushed it on from excesses to insanity irritated the tribune blindfolded the elections and finished by changing five years afterward the opposition of nineteen votes hostile to the bourbons into a heterogeneous but formidable majority in presence of which the monarchy had only the choice left between a humiliating resignation and a mortal coup d'etat chateaubriand now disappears from the field of history as one of its great figures he lived henceforth in retirement but bitter in his opposition to the government of which he had been the virtual head contributing largely to the journal des debats of which he was the life and by which he was supported in the next reign he refused the office of minister of public instruction as derogatory to his dignity but accepted the post of ambassador to rome a sort of honorable exile but he was an unhappy and disappointed man he had taken the wrong side in politics and probably saw his errors his genius if it had been directed to secure constitutional liberty would have made him a national idol for he lived to see the dethronement of louis philippe in eighteen forty eight but like Castlereagh in England, he threw his suburb talents in with the sinking cause of absolutism, and was after all a political failure. He lives only as a literary man, one of the most eloquent poets of his day, 
one of the lights of that splendid constellation of literary geniuses that arose on the fall of napoleon soon after the retirement of chateaubriand louis the eighteenth himself died at an advanced age having contrived to preserve his throne by moderation and honesty in his latter days he was exceedingly infirm in body but preserved his intellectual faculties to the last he was a lonely old man even while surrounded by a splendid court he wanted somebody to love at least to cheer him in his isolation for he had no peace in his family deeply as he was attached to its members he himself had discovered the virtues and disinterestedness of his minister de cannes and when his family and ministers drove away this favorite the king was devoted to him even in disgrace and made him his companion still later he found a substitute in madame du Caillou, one of those interesting and accomplished women peculiar to france she was not ambitious of ruling the king as her aunt madame de maintenon was of governing louis the fourteenth and her virtue was unimpeachable she wrote to the king letters twice a day but visited him only once a week she was the tool of a cabal rather than the leader of a court but her influence was healthy ennobling and religious Louis the Eighteenth was not what would be called a religious man. He performed his religious duties regularly, but in a perfunctory manner. He was not, however, a hypocrite or a Pharisee, but was simply indifferent to religious dogmas, and secretly adverse to the society of priests. When he was dying, it was with great difficulty that he could be made to receive extreme unction. He died without pain, recommending to his brother, who was to succeed him, to observe the charter of French liberties yet fearing that his blind bigotry would be the ruin of the family and the throne, as events proved. The last things to which the dying king clung were pomps and ceremonies, concealing even from courtiers his failing strength, and going through the mockery of dress and court etiquette to almost the very day of his death in 1824. The Comte d'Artois, now Charles X, ascended the throne, with the usual promises to respect the liberties of the nation, which his brother had conscientiously maintained. Unfortunately, Charles's intellect was weak and his conscience perverted. He was a narrow-minded, bigoted sovereign, ruled by priests and ultra-royalists, who magnified his prerogatives, appealed to his prejudices, and flattered his vanity. He was not cruel and bloodthirsty. He was even kind and amiable. But he was a fool, who could not comprehend the conditions by which only he could reign in safety who could not understand the spirit of the times or appreciate the difficulties with which he had to contend what was to be expected of such a monarch but continual blunders encroachments and follies verging upon crimes the nation cared nothing for his hunting parties his pleasures and his attachment to medieval ceremonies but it did care for its own rights and liberties purchased so dearly and guarded so zealously and when these were gradually attacked by a man who felt himself to be delegated from god with unlimited powers to rule not according to laws but according to his caprices and royal will then the ferment began first in the legislative assemblies then extending to journalists who controlled public opinion and finally to the discontented enraged and disappointed people the throne was undermined and there was no power in france to prevent the inevitable catastrophe in russia prussia and austria an overwhelming army bound together by the mechanism which absolutism for centuries had perfected could repress disorder but in a country where the army was comparatively small enlightened by the ideas of the revolution and fraternizing with the people this was not possible a napoleon with devoted and disciplined troops might have crushed his foes and reigned supreme but a weak and foolish monarch with a disaffected and scattered army with ministers who provoked all the hatreds and violent passions of legislators editors and people alike was powerless to resist or overcome the short reign of charles x was not marked by a single event of historical importance except the conquest of algiers and that was undertaken by the government to gain military eclat in other words popularity and this at the very time it was imposing restrictions on the press there were during this reign no reforms no public improvements no measures of relief for the poor no stimulus to new industries no public encouragement of art or literature no triumphs of architectural skill nothing to record but the strife of political parties and a systematic encroachment by the government on electoral rights on legislative freedom on the liberty of the press there was a senseless return to medieval superstitions and cruelties 
all to please the most narrow and intolerant class of men who ever traded on the exploded traditions of the past the jesuits returned to promulgate their sophistries and to impose their despotic yoke the halls of justice were presided over by the tools of arbitrary power great offices were given to the most obsequious slaves of royalty without regard to abilities or fitness there was not indeed the tyranny of spain or naples or austria but everything indicated a movement toward it those six years which comprised the reign of charles x were a period of reaction a return to the middle ages in both state and church a withering blast on all noble aspirations even the prime minister Villel, a legitimist and an ultra royalist was too liberal for the king and he was dismissed to make room for martinoc and he again for polignoc who had neither foresight nor prudence nor ability the generals of the republic and of the empire were removed from active service an indemnity of a thousand millions was given by an obsequious legislature to the men who had emigrated during the revolution a generous thing to do but a premium on cowardice and want of patriotism a base concession was made to the sacerdotal party by making it a capital offence to profane the sacred vessels of the churches or the consecrated wafer thus putting the power of life and death into the hands of the clergy not for crimes against society but for an insult to the religion of the middle ages but the laws passed against the press were the most irritating of all the press had become a power which it was dangerous to trifle with the one thing in modern times which affords the greatest protection to liberty which is most hated by despots and valued by enlightened minds a universal clamor was raised against this return to barbarism this extinction of light in favor of darkness this discarding of the national reason royalists and liberals alike denounced this culminating act of high treason against the majesty of the human mind this death blow to civilization chateaubriand royer collard dupont de lure even le bourdonnais predicted its fatal consequences and their impassioned eloquence from the tribune became in a few days the public opinion of the nation and the king in his infatuation saw no remedy for his increasing unpopularity but in dissolving the chamber of deputies and ordering a new election the blindest thing he could possibly do it was now seen that he was determined to rule in utter defiance of the charter he had sworn to defend and on the principles of undisguised absolutism all parties now coalesced against the king and his ministers the king then began to tamper with the military in order to establish by violence the old regime it was found difficult to fill ministerial appointments as everybody felt that the ship of state was drifting upon the rocks the king even determined to dissolve the new chamber of deputies before it met the elections having pronounced emphatically against his government at last the passions of the people became excited and daily increased in violence then came resistance to the officers of the law then riots then barricades then the occupation of the tuileries then ineffectual attempts of the military to preserve order and restrain the violence of the people marshal mamon with only twelve thousand troops was powerless against a great city in arms the king thinking it was only an emuet to be easily put down withdrew to st cloud and there he spent his time in playing whist as nero fiddled over burning rome until at last aroused by the vengeance of the whole nation he made his escape to england to rust in the old palace of the kings of scotland and to meditate over his kingly follies as napoleon meditated over his mistakes in the island of st helena thus closed the third act in the mighty drama which france played for one hundred years the first act revealing the passions of the revolution the second the abominations of military despotism the third the reaction toward the absolutism of the old regime and its final downfall two more acts are to be presented the perfidy and selfishness of louis philippe and the usurpation of louis napoleon but these must be deferred until in our course of lectures we have considered the reaction of liberal sentiments in england during the ministries of castlereagh canning and lord liverpool when the tories resigned as metternich did in vienna yet the reign of the bourbons while undistinguished by great events was not fruitless in great men on the fall of napoleon a crowd of authors editors orators and statesmen issued from their retreats and attracted notice by the brilliancy of their writings and speeches crushed or banished by the iron despotism of napoleon who hated literary genius they now became a new power in france not to propagate infidel sentiments and revolutionary theories but to awaken the nation to a sense of intellectual dignity and to maturer views of government 
to give a new impulse to literature art and science and to show how impossible it is to extinguish the fires of liberty when once kindled in the breasts of patriots or to put a stop to the progress of the human mind among an excitable intelligent though fickle people craving with passionate earnestness both popular rights and constitutional government in accordance with those laws of progress which form the basis of true civilization there was count joseph de maistre a royalist indeed but who propounded great truths mixed with great paradoxes believing all he said seeking to restore the authority of divine revelation in a world distracted by skepticism grand and eloquent in style and astonishing the infidels as much as he charmed the religious associated with him in friendship and in letters was the abbe de lamenay a young priest of brittany brought up amid its wilds in silent reverence and awe yet with the passions of a revolutionary order logical as Bousset, invoking young men not to the worship of medieval dogmas but to the shrine of reason allied with faith of another school was cousin the modern plato combating the materialism of the eighteenth century with mystic eloquence and drawing around him in his chair of philosophy at the sorbonne a crowd of enthusiastic young men which reminded one of abelard among his pupils in the infant university of paris cousin elevated the soul while he intoxicated the mind and created a spirit of inquiry which was felt wherever philosophy was recognized as one of the most ennobling studies that can dignify the human intellect in history both guizot and thiers had already become distinguished before they were engrossed in politics augustine thierry described with romantic fascination the exploits of the normans michaud brought out his crusades Barante his chronicles, Sismondi his Italian republics, Michelet his lively conception of France in the Middle Ages, Capefigue the life of Louis the Fourteenth, and Lamartine his poetical paintings of the Girondists. All these masterpieces gave a new interest to historical studies, infusing into history life and originality, not as a barren collection of annals and names in which pedantry passes for learning and uninteresting details for accuracy and scholarship in that inglorious period more first-class histories were produced in france than have appeared in england during the long reign of queen victoria where only three or four historians have reached the level of any one of those i have mentioned in genius or eloquence another set of men created journalism as the expression of public opinion and as a lever to overturn an obstinate despotism built upon the superstitions and dogmas of the middle ages a few young men almost unknown to fame with remorseless logic and fiery eloquence overturned a throne and established the press as a power that proved irresistible driving the priests of absolutism back into the shadows of eternal night and making reason the guide and glory of mankind among these were the disappointed and embittered chateaubriand who almost redeemed his devotion to the royal cause by those elegant essays which recalled the eloquence of his early life via main wrote for the moniteur royer collard and guizot for the courier with all the haughtiness and disdain which marked the doctrinaire or constitutional school etienne and pages for the constitutionnel ridiculing the excesses of the ultra royalists the pretensions of the clergy and the follies of the court de genois for the gazette de france and tears for the national in the realm of science arago explored the wonders of the heavens and cuvier penetrated the secrets of the earth in poetry only two names are prominent de lille and beranger but the french are not a poetical nation most of the great writers of france wrote in prose and for style they have never been surpassed if the poets were few after the restoration the novelists were many with transcendent excellences and transcendent faults reaching the heart by their pathos insulting the reason by their exaggerations captivating the imagination while shocking the moral sense painting manners and dissecting passions with powerful acute and vivid touch such were victor hugo eugene sue and alexander dumas whose creations interested all classes alike not merely in france but throughout the world the dignity of intellect amid political degradation was never more strikingly displayed than by those orators who arose during the reign of the bourbons the intrepid manuel uttering his protests against royal encroachments in a chamber of royalists all heated by passions and prejudices lanay and de Sir, pathetic and patriotic guizot 
de Broglie and de saint Hilaire, learned and profound. Royer colored, religious, disdainful, majestic. General Foy, disinterested and incorruptible. Lafitte, the banker. Benjamin Constant, the philosopher. Barrier, the lawyer. Chateaubriand, the poet, most eloquent of all. These and a host of others, some liberal, some conservative, all able, showed that genius was not extinguished amid all the attempts of absolutism to suppress it. It is true that none of these orators arose to supreme power, and that they were not equal to Mirabeau and other great lights in the revolutionary period. They were comparatively inexperienced in parliamentary business, and were watched and fettered by a hostile government, and could not give full scope to their indignant eloquence without personal peril. Nor did momentous questions of reform come before them for debate, as was the case in England during the agitation on the Reform Bill. They did little more than show the spirit that was in them, which under more favorable circumstances would arouse the nation. There was one more power which should be mentioned in connection with that period of torpor and reaction, and that was the influence of salons. To these all the bright intellects of Paris resorted, and gave full vent to their opinions, artists, scholars, statesmen, journalists, men of science, and brilliant women, in short, whoever was distinguished in any particular sphere. And these composed what is called society, a tremendous lever in fashionable life. In the salons of Madame de Stal, of the Duchess de Dora, of the Duchesse de Broglie, of Madame de saint Hilaire, and of Madame de Montcalm, all parties were represented, and all subjects were freely discussed. Here saint Beauve discoursed with those whom he was afterward to criticize. Here Talleyrand uttered his concise and emphatic sentences. Here Lafayette won hearts by his courteous manners and amiable disposition. Here Guizot prepared himself for the tribune and the press. Here Villemain, with the proud indifference, broached his careless skepticism. Here Montlossier blended aristocratical paradoxes with democratic theories. All these great men, and a host of others, Beranger, Constant, Etienne, Lamartine, Pasquier, Monnier, Molle, De Nouvi, Lanay, Barante, Cousin, Sismondi, freely exchanged opinions, and rested from their labors. A group of geniuses worth more than armies in the great contests between liberty and absolutism. And here it may be said that these kings and queens of society represented not material interests, not commerce, not manufactures, not stocks, not capital, not railways, not trade, not industrial exhibitions, not armies and navies, but ideas. Those invisible agencies which shake thrones and make revolutions, and lift the soul above that which is transient to that which is permanent. To religion, to philosophy, to art, to poetry, to the glories of home, to the certitudes of friendship, to the benedictions of heaven, which may exist in all their benign beauty and power, whatever be the form of government or the inequality of condition, in cottage or palace, in plenty or in want, among foes or friends, creating that sublime rest where men may prepare themselves for a future and imperishable existence. Such was the other side of France during the reign of the Bourbons, the lights which burst through the gloomy shades of tyranny and superstition to alleviate sorrows and disappointed hopes, the resurrection of intellect from the grave of despair. Authorities The history of the Restoration by Lamartine is the most interesting work I have read on the subject, but he is not regarded as a high authority. Talleyrand's Memoirs Memoirs de Chateaubriand La Crete Capafigue Alison, Biographie Universelle, Memoirs de Louis the Eighteenth, Fief, Mackenzie's History of the Nineteenth Century, all are interesting and worthy of perusal. End of section twelve. Section thirteen of Beacon Lights of History, Volume Nine, European Statesmen by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. George the Fourth, Part One. 1762 to 1830. Toryism. Were an intelligent and cultivated, though superficial, traveler to recount his impressions of England in 1815, when the Prince of Wales was regent of the kingdom and Lord Liverpool was prime minister, 
he would probably note his having been stuck with the splendid life of the nobility all great landed proprietors in their palaces at london and in their still more magnificent residences on their principal estates he would have seen a lavish if not an unbounded expenditure emblazoned and costly equipages liveried servants without number and all that wealth could purchase in the adornment of their homes he would have seen a perpetual round of banquets balls concerts receptions and garden parties to which only the elite of society were invited all dressed in the extreme of fashion blazing with jewels and radiant with the smiles of prosperity among the lions of this gorgeous society he would have seen the most distinguished statesmen of the day chiefly peers of the realm with the blue ribbon across their shoulders the diamond garter below their knees and the heraldic star upon their breasts perhaps he might have met some rising orator like canning or percival whose speeches were in every mouth men destined to the highest political honors pets of high-born ladies for the brilliancy of their genius the silvery tones of their voices and the courtly elegance of their manners tories in their politics and aristocrats in their sympathies the traveller if admitted as a stranger to these grand assemblages would have seen but few lawyers except of the very highest distinction perhaps here and there a bishop or a dean with the paraphernalia of clerical rank but no physician no artist no man of science no millionaire banker no poet no scholar unless his fame had gone out to all the world the brilliancy of the spectacle would have dazzled him and he would unhesitatingly have pronounced those titled men and women to be the most fortunate the most favored and perhaps the most happy of all people on the face of the globe since added to the distinctions of rank and the pride of power they had the means of purchasing all the pleasures known to civilization and more than all held a secure social position which no slander could reach and no hatred could affect or if he followed these magnates to their country estates after the season had closed and parliament was prorogued he would have seen the palaces of these lordly proprietors of innumerable acres filled with a retinue of servants that would have carried out the admiration of cicero or crassus all in imposing liveries but with cringing manners and a crowd of aristocratic visitors filling perhaps a hundred apartments spending their time according to their individual inclinations some in the magnificent library of the palace some riding in the park others fox hunting with the hounds or shooting hares and partridges others again flirting with ennuied ladies in the walks or boudoirs or gilded drawing-rooms but all meeting at dinner in full dress in the carved and decorated banqueting hall the sideboards of which groaned under the load of gold and silver plate of the rarest patterns and most expensive workmanship everywhere the eye would have rested on priceless pictures rare tapestries bronze and marble ornaments sumptuous sofas and lounges mirrors of venetian glass chandeliers antique vases bric-a-brac of every description brought from every corner of the world the conversation of these titled aristocrats most of them educated at oxford and cambridge cultivated by foreign travel and versed in the literature of the day though full of prejudices was generally interesting while their manners though cold and haughty were easy polished courteous and dignified it is true most of them would swear and get drunk at their banquets but their profanity was conventional rather than blasphemous and they seldom got drunk till late in the evening and then on wines older than their children from the most famous vineyards of europe during the day they were able to attend to business if they had any and seldom drank anything stronger than ale and beer their breakfasts were light and their lunches simple living much in the open air and fond of the pleasures of the chase they were generally healthy and robust the prevailing disease which crippled them was gout but this was owing to champagne and burgundy rather than to brandy and turtle soups for at that time no englishman of rank dreamed that he could dine without wine william pitt it is said found less than three bottles insufficient for his dinner when he had been working hard among them all there was great outward reverence for the church and few missed its services on sundays or failed to attend family prayers in their private chapels as conducted by their chaplains among whom probably not a dissenter could be found in the whole realm both catholics and dissenters were alike held in scornful contempt or indifference and had inferior social rank on the whole these aristocrats were a decorous class of men though narrow bigoted reserved and proud devoted to pleasure idle extravagant and callous to the wrongs and misery of the poor 
they did not insult the people by arrogance or contumely like the old roman nobles but they were not united to them by any other ties than such as a master would feel for his slaves and as slaves are obsequious to their masters and sometimes loyal so the humbler classes especially in the country worship the ground on which these magnates walked how courteous the nobles are said a wealthy plebeian manufacturer to me once at manchester i was to show my mill to lord ducie and as my carriage drove up i was about to mount the box with the coachman but my lord most kindly told me to jump in so much for the highest class of all in england about the year of eighteen fifteen suppose the attention of the traveller were now turned to the legislative halls in which public affairs were discussed particularly to the house of commons supposed to represent the nation he would have seen five or six hundred men in plain attire with their hats on listless and inattentive except when one of their leaders was making a telling speech against some measure proposed by the opposite party and nearly all measures were party measures who were these favored representatives nearly all of them were the sons or brothers or cousins or political friends of the class to which i have just alluded with here and there a baronet or powerful county squire or eminent lawyer or wealthy manufacturer or princely banker but all with their aristocratic sympathies nearly all conservative with a preponderance of tories scarcely a man without independent means indifferent to all questions except such as affected party interests and generally opposed to all movements which had in view the welfare of the middle classes to which they could not be said to belong they did not represent manufacturing towns nor the shopkeepers still less the people in their rugged toils ignorant even when they could read and write they represented the great landed interests of the country for the most part and legislated for the interests of landlords and the gentry the established church and the aristocratic universities indeed for the wealthy and the great not for the nation as a whole except when great public dangers were imminent at that time however the traveller would have heard the most magnificent bursts of eloquence ever heard in parliament speeches which are immortal classical beautiful and electrifying on the front benches was canning scarcely inferior to pitt or fox as an orator stately sarcastic witty rhetorical musical as full of genius as an egg is full of meat there was castlereagh not eloquent but gifted the honored plenipotentiary and negotiator at the congress of vienna the friend of metternich and the czar alexander at that time perhaps the most influential of the ministers of state the incarnation of aristocratic manners and ultra-conservative principles there was peel just rising to fame and power wealthy proud and aristocratic as conservative as wellington himself a tory of the tories there were percival the future prime minister great both as lawyer and statesman and lord palmerston secretary of state for war on the opposite benches sat lord john russell timidly maturing schemes for parliamentary reform lucid of thought and in utterance clear as a bell there too sat henry brougham not yet famous but a giant in debate and overwhelming in his impetuous invectives there were romilly the law reformer and tierney plunkett and huskisson all great orators and other eminent men whose names were on every tongue the traveller entranced by the power and eloquence of these leaders could scarcely have failed to feel that the house of commons was the most glorious assembly on earth the incarnation of the highest political wisdom the theatre and school of the noblest energies worthy to instruct and guide the english nation or any other nation in the world from the legislature we follow our traveller to the church the established church of course for nonconformist ministers whatever their leaning and oratorical gifts ranked scarcely above shopkeepers and farmers and were viewed by the aristocracy as leaders of sedition rather than preachers of righteousness the higher dignitaries of the only church recognized by fashion and rank were peers of the realm presidents of colleges dons in the universities bishops with an income of ten thousand pounds a year or more deans of cathedrals prebendaries and archdeacons who wore a distinctive dress from the other clergy i need not say that they were the most aristocratic cynical bigoted and intolerant of all the upper ranks in the social scale though it must be confessed that they were generally men of learning and respectability more versed however in the classics of greece and rome than in st paul's epistles and with greater sympathy for the rich than for the poor to whom the gospel was originally preached the untitled clergy of the church in their rural homes for the country and not the city was the paradise of rectors and curates as of squires and men of leisure were also for the most part classical scholars and gentlemen 
though some thought more of hunting and fishing than of the sermons they were to preach on Sundays. Nothing to the eye of a cultivated traveller was more fascinating than the homes of these country clergymen, rectories and parsonages, as they were called. Concealed amid shrubberies, groves, and gardens, where flowers bloomed by the side of the ivy and myrtle, ever green and flourishing. They were not large but comfortable abodes, of plenty if not of luxury, freeholds which could not be taken away, suggestive of rest and repose, for the favoured occupant of such a holding, supported by tithes, could neither be ejected nor turned out of his living, which he held for life, whether he preached well or poorly, whether he visited his flock or buried himself amid his books, whether he dined out with the squire or went up to town for amusement, whether he played lawn-tennis in the afternoon with aristocratic ladies or cards in the evening with gentlemen none too sober. He had an average stipend of two hundred pounds a year, equal to four hundred pounds in these times, moderate but sufficient for his own wants, if not for those of his wife and daughters, who pined, of course, for a more exciting life, and for richer dresses than he could afford to give them. His sermons, it must be confessed, were not very instructive, suggestive, or eloquent, were, in fact, without point, delivered in a drawing monotone. But then his hearers were not used to oratorical displays or learned treatises in the pulpit, and were quite satisfied with the glorious liturgy, if well intoned, and pious chants from the surpliced boys, if it happened to be a church rich and venerable in which they worshipped. Not less imposing and impressive than the church would the traveller have found the courts of law. The House of Lords was indeed, in a general sense, a legislative assembly, where the peers deliberated on the same subjects that occupied the attention of the commons. But it was also the supreme judicial tribunal of the realm, a great court of appeals of which only the law lords, ex-chancellors and judges, who were peers, were the real members, presided over by the Lord Chancellor, who also held court alone for the final decision of important equity questions. The other courts of justice were held by twenty-four judges, in different departments of the law, who presided in their scarlet robes in Westminster Hall, and who also held assizes in the different counties for the trial of criminals, all men of great learning and personal dignity, who were held in awe, since they were the representatives of the king himself to decree judgments and punish offenders against the law. Even those barristers who pleaded at these tribunals quailed before the searching glance of these judges, who were the picked men of their great profession, whom no sophistry could deceive and no rhetoric could win. Men held in supreme honor for their exalted station as well as for their force of character and acknowledged abilities. In no other country were judges so well paid, so independent, so much feared, and so deserving of honors and dignities. And in no other country were judges armed with more power, nor were they more bland and courteous in their manners and more just in their decisions. It was something to be a judge in England. Turning now from peers, legislators, judges, and bishops, the men who composed the governing class, all equally aristocratic and exclusive, let us, with our travellers, survey the middle class, who were neither rich nor poor, living by trade, chiefly shopkeepers, with a sprinkling of dissenting ministers, solicitors, surgeons, and manufacturers. Among these the observer is captivated by the richness and splendour of their shops, over which were dark and dingy chambers used as residences by their plebeian occupants, except such as were rented as lodgings to visitors and men of means. These people of business were rarely ambitious of social distinction, for that was beyond their reach. But they lived comfortably, dined on roast beef and Yorkshire pudding on Sunday, with tolerable sherry or port to wash it down, went to church or chapel regularly in silk or broadcloth, were good citizens, had a horror of bailiffs, could converse on what was going on in trade and even in politics to a limited extent, and generally advocated progressive and liberal sentiments, unless some of their relatives were employed in some way or other in noble houses, in which case their loyalty to the crown and admiration of rank were excessive and amusing. They read good books when they read at all, educated their children, some of whom became governesses, travelled a little in the summer, were hospitable to their limited circle of friends, were kind and obliging, put on no airs, and were on the whole useful and worthy people, if we cannot call them respectable members of society. They were, perhaps, the happiest and most contented of all the various classes, since they were virtuous, frugal, industrious, and thought more of duties than they did of pleasures. These were the people who were soon to discuss rights rather than duties, and whom the reform movement was to turn into political enthusiasts. Such was the bright side of the picture which a favoured traveller would have seen at the close of the Napoleonic Wars, on the whole one of external prosperity and grandeur compared with most continental countries an envied civilization, the boast of liberty, for there was no regal despotism. 
the monarch could send no one to jail or exile him or cut off his head except in accordance with law and the laws could deprive no one of personal liberty without sufficient cause determined by judicial tribunals and yet this splendid exterior was deceptive the traveller saw only the rich or favoured or well-to-do classes there were toiling and suffering millions whom he did not see although the laws were made to favour the agricultural interests yet there was distress among agricultural labourers and the dearer the price of corn that is the worse the harvests the more the landlords were enriched and the more wretched were those who raised the crops in times of scarcity when harvests were poor the quartern loaf sold sometimes for two shillings when the labourer could earn on average only six or seven shillings a week think of a family compelled to live on seven shillings a week with what the wife and children could additionally earn there was rent to pay and coals and clothing to buy to say nothing of a proper and varied food supply yet all that the family could possibly earn would not pay for bread alone and the condition of the laboring classes in the mines and the mills was still worse for not half of them could get work at all even at a shilling a day the disbanding of half a million of soldiers without any settled occupation filled every village and hamlet with vagrants and vagabonds demoralized by war during the war with france there had been a demand for every sort of manufactures but the peace cut off this demand and the factories were either closed or were running on half time then there was the dreadful burden of taxation direct and indirect to pay the interest of a national debt swelled to the enormous amount of eight hundred million pounds and to meet the current expenses of the government which were excessive and frequently unnecessary such as sinecures pensions and grants to the royal family this debt pressed upon all classes alike and prevented the use of all those luxuries which we now regard as necessities like sugar tea coffee and even meat there were import duties almost prohibitory on many articles which few could do without and worst of all on corn and all cereals without these it was possible for the laboring class to live even when they earned only a shilling a day but when these were retained to swell the income of that upper class whose glories and luxuries i have already mentioned there was inevitable starvation to any kind of popular sorrow and misery however the government seemed indifferent and this was followed of course by discontent and crime riots and incendiary conflagrations murders and highway robberies an incipient pandemonium disgusting to see and horrible to think of at the best what dens of misery and filth and disease were the quarters of the poor in city and country alike especially in the coal districts and in manufacturing towns and when these pallid half-starred miners and operatives begrimed with smoke and dirt issued from their infernal hovels and gathered in crowds threatening all sorts of violence and dispersed only at the point of the bayonet there was something to call out fear as well as compassion from those who lived upon their toils end of section thirteen Section 14 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 9, European Statesmen, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. George the Fourth, Part 2. At last good men became aroused at the injustice and wretchedness which filled every corner of the land, and sent up their petitions to Parliament for reform. Not for the mere alleviation of miseries, but for a reform in representation so that men might be sent as legislators who would take some interest in the condition of the poor and oppressed yet even to these petitions the aristocratic commons paid but little heed the sigh of the mourner was unheard and the tear of anguish was unnoticed by those who lived in their lordly palaces what was desperate suffering and agitation for relief they called agrarian discontent and revolutionary excess to be put down by the most vigorous measures the government could devise o tempora o mores the roman orator exclaimed in view of social evils which would bear no comparison with those that afflicted a large majority of the human beings who struggled for a miserable existence in the most lauded country in europe in their despair might well they exclaim who shall deliver us from the body of this death I often wonder that the people of England were as patient and orderly as they were, under such aggravated misfortunes. In France the oppressed would probably have risen in a burst of frenzy and wrath, and perhaps unseated the monarch on his throne. But the English mobs erected no barricades, and used no other weapons than groans and expostulations. 
they did not demand rights but bread they were not agitators but sufferers promises of relief disarmed them and they sadly returned to their wretched homes to see no radical improvement in their condition their only remedy was patience and patience without much hope nothing could really relieve them but returning prosperity and that depended more on events which could not be foreseen than on legislation itself such was the condition in general terms of high and low rich and poor in england in the year eighteen fifteen and i have now to show what occupied the attention of the government for the next fifteen years during the reign of george the fourth as regent and as king but first let us take a brief review of the men prominent in the government Lord Liverpool was the Prime Minister of England for fifteen years, from 1812, succeeding to Percival upon the latter's assassination, to 1827. He was a man of moderate abilities, but honest and patriotic. This chief merit was in the tact by which he kept together a cabinet of conflicting political sentiments, but he lived in comparatively quiet times when everybody wanted rest and repose and when he had only to combat domestic evils. The Lord Chancellor, Lord Eldon, had been seated on the woolsack from nearly the beginning of the century, and was the keeper of the King's conscience for twenty-five years, enjoying his great office for a longer period than any other Lord Chancellor in English history. He was doubtless a very great lawyer, and a man of remarkable sagacity and insight, but the narrowest and most bigoted of all the great men who controlled the destinies of the nation. He absolutely abhorred any change whatever and any kind of reform. He adhered to what was already established, and because it was established. Therefore he was a good churchman, and a most reliable Tory. The most powerful man in the cabinet at this time, holding the second office in the government, that of foreign secretary, was Lord Castlereagh. No very great scholar, or orator, or man of business, but an inveterate Tory who played into the hands of all the despots of Europe, and who made captive more powerful minds than his own by the elegance of his manners, the charm of his conversation, and the intensity of his convictions. William Pitt never showed greater sagacity than when he bought the services of this gifted aristocrat, for he was then a Whig, and introduced him into Parliament. He was the most prominent minister of the crown until he died, directing foreign affairs with ability, but in the wrong direction. The friend and ally of Metternich, Chateaubriand, Hardenberg, and the monarchs whom they represented. But foremost in genius among the great statesmen of the day was George Canning, who, however, did not reach the summit of his ambition until the latter part of the reign of George the Fourth. But after the death of Castlereagh in 1822, he was the leading spirit of the cabinet, holding the great office of foreign secretary, second in rank and power only to that of the premier. Although a Tory, the follower and disciple of Pitt, it was Canning who gave the first great blow to the narrow and selfish conservatism which marked the government of his day, and entered the first wedge which was to split the Tory ranks and inaugurate reform. For this he acquired the greatest popularity that any statesman in England ever enjoyed, if we accept Fox and Pitt, and at the same time incurred the bitterest wrath which the Metternichs of the world have ever cherished toward the benefactors of mankind. Canning was born in London, in the year 1770, in comparatively humble life, his father being a dissipated and broken-down barrister, and his mother compelled by poverty to go upon the stage. But he had a wealthy relative who took care of his education. In 1788 he entered Christ Church College, where he won the prize for the best Latin poem that Oxford had ever produced. After he had graduated with distinguished honors, he entered as a law student at Lincoln's Inn, but before he wore the gown of a barrister, Pitt had sought him out, as he had Castlereagh, having heard of his talents in debating societies. Pitt secured him a seat in Parliament, and Canning made his first speech on the 31st of January, 1794. The aid which he brought to the ministry secured his rapid advancement. In a year after his maiden speech he was made Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs at the age of twenty-five. On the death of Pitt in 1806, when the Whigs for a short period came into power, Canning was the recognized leader of the opposition, and in 1807, when the Tories returned to power, he became Foreign Secretary in the Ministry of the Duke of Portland, of which Mr. Percival was the leading member. It was then that Canning seized the Danish fleet at Copenhagen, giving as his excuse for this bold and high-handed measure that Napoleon would have taken it if he had not. It was through his influence and that of Lord Castlereagh that Sir Arthur Wellesley, afterward the Duke of Wellington, was sent to Spain to conduct the Peninsular War. 
on the retirement of the duke of portland as head of the government in eighteen o nine mr percival became minister an event soon followed by the insanity of george the third and the entrance of robert peel into the house of commons in eighteen twelve mr percival was assassinated and the long ministry of lord liverpool began supported by all the eloquence and influence of canning between whom and his chief a close friendship had existed since their college days the foreign secretaryship was offered to canning but he being comparatively poor preferred the lisbon embassy on the large salary of fourteen thousand pounds in eighteen fourteen he became president of the board of control and remained in that office until he was appointed governor-general of india on the death of castlereagh eighteen twenty two by his own hand canning resumed the post of foreign secretary and from that time was the master spirit of the government leader of the house of commons the most powerful orator of his day and the most popular man in england he had now become more liberal showing a sympathy with reform acknowledging the independence of the south american colonies and virtually breaking up the holy alliance by his disapprobation of the policy of the congress of vienna which aimed at the total overthrow of liberty in europe and which under the guidance of metternich and with the support of castlereagh had already given norway to sweden the duchy of genoa to sardinia restored the pope to his ancient possessions and made italy what it was before the french revolution the most mischievous thing which the holy alliance had in view was interference in the internal affairs of all the continental states under the guise of religion england under the leadership of castlereagh would have upheld this foreign interference of russia prussia and austria but canning withdrew england from this intervention a great service to his country and to civilization in fact the great principle of his political life was non-intervention in the internal affairs of other nations hence he refused to join the great powers in reseating the king of spain on his throne from which that monarch had been temporarily ejected by a popular insurrection but for him the great powers might have united with spain to recover her lost possessions in south america to him the peace of the world at that critical period was mainly owing in one of his most famous speeches he closed with the oft-quoted sentence i called the new world into existence to redress the balance of the old canning like peel and like gladstone in our own time grew more and more liberal as he advanced in years in experience and in power although he never left the tory ranks his commercial policy was identical with that of his friend huskisson which was that commerce flourished best when wholly unfettered by restrictions he held that protection in the abstract was unsound and unjust and thus he opened the way for free trade a great boon which sir robert peel gave to the nation under the teachings of cobden he was also in favor of catholic emancipation and the repeal of the test act which the duke of wellington was compelled against his will ultimately to give to the nation at the head of all this array of brilliant statesmen stood the king or in this case the regent who was a man of very different character from most of the ministers who served him it was in january eighteen eleven that the prince of wales became regent in consequence of the insanity of his father george the third it was during the peninsular war when wellington then sir arthur wellesley was wearing out the french in spain but the reign of this prince as regent is barren of great political movements there is scarcely anything to record but riots and discontent among the lower classes in the incendiary speeches and writings of demagogues measures of relief were proposed in parliament also for parliamentary reform and the removal of catholic disabilities but they were all alike opposed by the tory government and came to nothing four years after the beginning of the regency saw the overthrow of napoleon and the nation was so wearied of war and all great political excitement that it had sunk into inglorious repose it was the period of reaction of ultra conservatism and hatred of progressive and revolutionary ideas when such men as cobbett and hunt henry were persecuted fined and imprisoned for their ideas cobbett the most popular writer of the day was forced to fly to america government was utterly intolerant of all political agitation which was chiefly confined to men without social position but of all the magnates who were opposed to reform the prince regent was the most obstinate he was wholly devoted to pleasure his court at the carlton palace was famous for the assemblage of wits and beauties and dandies reminding us of the epicureanism which marked versailles during the reign of louis the fifteenth it was the most scandalous period in england since the time of charles the second the life of the regent was a perpetual scandal especially in his heartless treatment of women and the disgraceful revels in which he indulged the companions of the prince were mostly dissipated and inuid courtiers 
as impersonated in that incarnation of dandyism who went by the name of beau brummel a contemptible character who yet it seems was the leader of fashion especially in dress of which the prince himself was inordinately fond this boon companion of royalty required two different artists to make his gloves and he went home after the opera to change his cravat for succeeding parties his impertinence and audacity exceeded anything ever recorded of men of fashion as when he requested his royal master to ring the bell nothing is more pitiable than his miserable end deserted by all his friends a helpless idiot in a lunatic asylum having exhausted all of his means lord yarmouth afterward the marquis of hertford infamous for his debaucheries and extravagance was another of the prince's companions in folly and drunkenness so was lord fife who expended eighty thousand pounds on a dancer and a host of others who had however that kind of wit which would set the table on a roar but all gamblers drunkards and sensualists who gloried in the ruin of those women whom they had made victims of their pleasures but i passed by the revelries and follies of the first gentleman in the realm as he was called to allude to one event which has historical importance and which occupied the attention of the whole country and that was the persecution of his wife who was also his cousin caroline amelia elizabeth daughter of the duke of brunswick he drove her from the nuptial bed and from his palace he sought also to get a divorce which failed by reason of the transcendent talents and eloquence of brougham and denham eminent lawyers whom she employed in her defence and which brought them out prominently before the eyes of the nation for the great career of brougham especially began with the trial of caroline of brunswick the unhappy woman whom the prince of wales married to get relief from his peculiar necessities and whom he insulted as soon as he saw her although she was a princess of considerable accomplishments and as amiable as she was beneficent the only palliation of his infamous treatment of this woman was that he never loved her and was even disgusted with her no sooner was the marriage solemnized than she was treated on every occasion with studied contumely and scarcely had she recovered from illness incident to the birth of the princess charlotte when the first gentleman of the age was pleased to intimate that it suited his disposition that they should hereafter live apart never allowed to be crowned as queen driven from the shelter of her husband's roof surrounded with spies accused of crimes of which there was no proof even excluded from the public prayers and finally forced into exile she sank under her accumulated wrongs and was carried off by a fatal illness at the age of fifty-three on the death of the old king in eighteen twenty the prince of wales became george the fourth after having been regent for nine years as he was inflexibly opposed to all reforms no great measures had been carried through parliament except from urgent necessity and fear of revolution but the state was being prepared for reforms in the next reign in eighteen twenty the agitation which finally ended in the reform bill set in with great earnestness henry brougham had become a great power in the house of commons and poured out the vials of his wrath on the tory government lord john russell busily employed himself in forging the weapons by which he more than any other man afterward broke the power of the tories the voice of wilberforce was also heard in demanding the abolition of negro slavery romilly was advocating a reform in criminal law macaulay was making those brilliant speeches which would have elevated him to the highest rank among debaters had he not cherished other ambitions the only things which stand out as memorable and of political importance in this reign were a change in the foreign policy of england the discontents and agitations of the people the removal of catholic disabilities and the repeal of the test acts on the first i shall not dwell since i have already alluded to it as the great work of canning as foreign minister he divorced england from the holy alliance and insisted on maintaining non-intervention in the internal affairs of other nations and a peace policy which raised his country to the highest pinnacle of power she ever attained and brought about a development of wealth and industry entirely unprecedented had he lived he would have carried out those reforms that later were the glory of lord john russell and sir robert peel for he was emancipated from the ideas which made the tories obnoxious his spirit was liberal and progressive and hence he incurred bitter hostilities the government however could not be carried on without him and the king was forced unwillingly to accept him as minister his magnificent services as foreign secretary had mollified the hostilities of george the fourth who became anxious to retain him in power at the head of the foreign department after the retirement of lord liverpool but canning felt that the premiership was his due and would accept nothing short of it and the king was forced to give it to him in spite of the howl of the tory leaders 
he enjoyed that dignity however but two months being worn out with labors and embittered by the hostilities of his political enemies who hounded him to death with the most cruel and unrelenting hatred his sensitive and proud nature could not stand before such unjust attacks and savage calumnies he rapidly sank in the prime of his life and in the height of his fame canning's death in eighteen twenty seven was a marked event in the reign of george the fourth it filled england with mourning and never was grief for a departed statesman more sincere and profound he was buried with great pomp in westminster abbey the sculptor chantry was entrusted with the execution of his statue a memorial which he did not need for his fame is imperishable the day after the funeral his wife was made a peeress an annuity was granted to his sons and every honor that it was possible for a grateful nation to bestow was lavished on his memory canning left only twenty thousand pounds a less sum than he had received from his wife upon his marriage his domestic life was singularly happy he was also happy in the brilliant promises of his sons one of whom became the governor-general of india and was created a peer for his services his only daughter married the marquis of clanricard his children thus entered the ranks of the nobility a distinction which he himself did not covet it was his chief ambition to rule the nation through the house of commons some authorities have regarded canning as the greatest of english parliamentary orators but his speeches to me are disappointing although elaborate argumentative logical and full of fancy and wit they were too rhetorical to suit the taste of lord brougham rhetorical exhibitions however brilliant are not those which posterity most highly value and lose their charm when the occasions which produce them have passed away canning's presence was commanding and dignified his articulation delicate and precise his voice clear and musical while the curl of his lip and the glance of his eye would silence almost any antagonist in cabinet meetings he was habitually silent having already made up his mind he could not gracefully bear contradiction and made many enemies by his pride and sarcasm in private life he was courteous and gentlemanly fond of society but fonder of domestic life pure in his moral character devoted to his family especially to his mother whom he treated with extraordinary deference and affection end of section fourteen section fifteen of beacon lights of history volume nine european statesman by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by K. Hand. George the Fourth, Part Three. The next subject of historical importance in the reign of George the Fourth was the perpetual agitation among the people growing out of their misery and discontent. There were no great insurrections to overturn a throne, as in Spain and Italy and France, but there was a fierce demand for the removal of evils which were intolerable, and this was manifested in monster petitions to Parliament in incendiary speeches like those made by orator hunt and other agitators in such political tracts as cobbett wrote and circulated in every corner of the land in occasional uprisings among agricultural laborers and factory operatives in angry mobs destroying private property all impelled by hunger and despair to these discontents and angry uprisings the government was haughty and cold looking upon them as revolutionary and dangerous and putting them down by sheriffs and soldiers by coercion bills and the suspension of the act of habeas corpus some speeches were made in parliament in favor of education and some efforts in behalf of law reforms especially the removal of the death penalty for small offenses more than two hundred of which were punishable with death numerous were the instances where men and boys were condemned to the gallows for stealing a coat or shooting a hare but the sentences of judges were often not enforced when unusually severe or unjust moreover large charities were voted for the poor but without materially relieving the general distress on the whole however the country increased in wealth and prosperity in consequence of the long and uninterrupted peace and the only great drawback was the mercantile crisis of eighteen twenty five resulting from the mania of speculation and followed by the contraction of the currency the effect of which was the failure of banks and the ruin of thousands who had calculated on being suddenly enriched allison estimates the shrinkage of property in great britain alone as at least one hundred million pounds men worth one hundred thousand pounds could not at one time raise one hundred pounds the banks were utterly drained of gold and silver nothing prevented universal bankruptcy but the issue of small bills by the bank of england 
there was a lull of political excitement after the trial of queen caroline and parliament confined itself chiefly to legal economical and commercial questions although occasionally there were grand debates on the foreign policy on catholic emancipation and on the disfranchisement of corrupt boroughs ireland obtained considerable parliamentary attention owing to the failure of the potato crop and its attendant agricultural distress which produced a state bordering on rebellion and to the formation of the catholic association but the great event in the political history of england during the reign of george the fourth was unquestionably the removal of catholic disabilities ranking next in importance and interest with the reform bill and the repeal of the corn laws catholic disability had existed ever since the reign of elizabeth and was the standing injustice under which ireland labored catholic peers were not admitted to the house of lords nor catholics to a seat in the house of commons which was a condition of extremely unequal representation in reality only the protestants were represented in parliament and they composed only about one-tenth of the whole population in addition to this injustice the irish who were mostly roman catholic were ground down by such oppressive laws that they were really serfs to those landlords who owned the soil on which they toiled for a mere pittance about four pence a day resulting in a general poverty such as has never before been seen in any european country with its attendant misery and crime the miserable irish peasantry lived in mud huts or cabins covered partially with thatch but not enough to keep out the rain no furniture and no comforts were to be seen in these huts there were no chairs or tables only a sort of dresser for laying a plate upon no cooking utensils but a cast metal pot to boil potatoes almost the only food there were no bedsteads and but few blankets the people slept in their clothes the whole family generally in one room the only room in the cabin for fuel they burned peat in order to pay their rent they sold their pigs beggars infested every road and filled every village no one was certain of employment even at two pence a day everybody was controlled by the priests whose power rested on their ability to stimulate religious fears and who were supported by such contributions as they were able to extort from the superstitious and ignorant people by nature brave and generous and joyous but improvident and reckless it was the wonder of o'connell how they could remain cheerful amid such privations and such wrongs with the government seemingly indifferent and none to pity and few to help nor could they vote for the candidates for any office whatever unless they had freeholds or life rent possessions for which they paid a rent of forty shillings the landlords of this wretched tenantry unable to face the misery they saw and which they could not relieve or fearful of assassination left the country to spend their incomes in the great cities of europe not being united with their people by any ties social or religious what wonder that such a wretched people urged by the priests should form associations for their own relief especially when famine pressed and landlords exacted the uttermost farthing when the crimes to which they were impelled by starvation were punished with the most inexorable severity by protestant magistrates in whose appointment they had no hand the result was the rise of the catholic association the declared object of which was to forward petitions to parliament to support an independent press to aid emigration to america all worthy and unobjectionable on the surface but with the real intent as affirmed by the tories and believed by a large majority of the nation of securing the control of elections of bringing about the repeal of the union with england which enacted in eighteen o one had done away with the separate irish parliament the resumption of the church property by the catholic clergy and the restoration of the catholic faith as the dominant religion of the land such an association embracing most of the roman catholic population was regarded with great alarm by the government and they determined to put it down as seditious and dangerous against the expostulation of such men as brougham mackintosh and sir henry parnell then arose the great figure of o'connell in the history of ireland whose eloquence tact and ability have no parallel in that country of orators defending the cause of his countrymen with masterly power leading them like a second moses according to his will in fact uniting them in a movement which it was hopeless to expose except with an army bent on the depopulation of the country so that george the fourth is reported to have said with considerable bitterness canning is king of england o'connell is king of ireland and i am dean of windsor such however was the hostility of parliament to the irish catholics that a bill was carried by a great majority in both houses to suppress the association 
supported powerfully by the duke of york as well as by the ministers of the crown even by canning himself and sir robert peel then followed renewed disturbances riots and murders for the condition of the roman catholics in ireland was desperate as well as gloomy the association was dissolved for O'Connell would do nothing unlawful but a new one took its place which preached peace and unity but which meant the repeal of the union the grand object that from first to last o'connell had at heart of course this scheme was utterly impracticable without a revolution that would shake england to its center but it was followed by an immense emigration to america so great that the population of ireland declined from eight and a half to four and a half millions irish catholics however were comparatively quiet during the administration of mr canning whose liberal tendencies had given them hope but on his death they became more restive the coalition ministry under lord goderick was much embarrassed how to act or was too feeble to act with vigor not for want of individual abilities but by reason of dissensions among the ministers it lasted only a short time and was succeeded by that of the duke of wellington with sir robert peel for his lieutenant both of whom had shown an intense prejudice and dislike of the irish catholics and had voted uniformly for their repression on the return of the tories to power the irish disturbances were renewed and increased hitherto the landlords had directed the votes of their tenantry the forty shilling freeholders but now the elections were determined by the direction of the catholic association which was controlled by the priests and by o'connell and his associates in addition o'connell himself was elected to represent in english parliament the county of clare against the whole weight of the government which was a bitter pill for the tories to swallow especially as the great agitator declared his intention to take his seat without submitting to the customary oath it was in reality a defiance of the government backed by the whole irish nation the catholics became so threatening they came together so often and in such enormous masses that the nation was thoroughly alarmed the king and a majority of his ministers urged the most violent coercive measures even to the suspension of habeas corpus o'connell was not admitted to parliament but his case precipitated an intense turmoil which settled the question for ever for then the great general who had defeated napoleon and was the idol of the nation seeing the difficulties of coercion as no other statesman did and influenced by sir robert peel for whom he had unbounded respect made one of his masterly retreats by which he averted revolution and bloodshed wellington hated the catholics and was a most loyal member of the church of england moreover he was a tory and an ultra conservative but at last even his eyes were opened not to the injustices and wrongs which ground ireland to the dust but to the necessity of conciliation like peel he could face facts and when his path was clear he would walk therein whatever kings or ministers or peers or people might think or say he resolved to emancipate the catholics as sir robert peel afterward repealed the corn laws against all his antecedents and affiliations and sympathies and more than all against the declared wishes and resolutions of the monarch whom he nominally served yet whom he controlled by his iron will sir robert peel as obstinate a tory as his chief had been for some time convinced of the necessity of conciliation and at once resigned his seat as the representative of oxford university which he felt he could no longer honorably hold in march eighteen twenty nine he brought forward his bill for the removal of catholic disabilities which was read the third time and passed the commons by a majority of one hundred seventy eight in the house of peers it was carried by a majority of one hundred four so great was the influence of wellington and peel so impressed at last were both houses of the necessity for the measure the difficulty now was to obtain the signature of the king although he had promised it as the probable alternative of revolution a great state necessity which his ministers had made him at last perceive but to which he reluctantly yielded he was somewhat in the position of pope clement the fourteenth when obliged against his will and against the interests of the catholic church to sign the bull for the revocation of the charter of the jesuits compulsus feci compulsus feci he exclaimed with mental agony george the fourth could have said the same he procrastinated he lay all day in bed to avoid seeing his ministers he talked of his feelings he threatened to abdicate and go to hanover he would not violate his conscience he would be faithful to the traditions of his house and the memory of his father and so on until the patience of wellington and peel was exhausted and they told him he must sign the bill at once or they would immediately resign the king could no longer wriggle off the hook and surrendered 
O'Connell was instantly re-elected and took his seat in Parliament, a position which he occupied for the rest of his life. George the Fourth was the last of the monarchs of England who attempted to rule by a personal government. Henceforward the monarch's duty was simply to register the decrees of Parliament. But the admission of Catholics to Parliament did not heal the disorders of Ireland, as had been hoped. The Irish clamored for still greater privileges. The cry for repeal of the Union succeeded that for the removal of disabilities. Their poverty and miseries remained, while their monster meetings continued to shake the kingdom to its center. The historical importance of Catholic emancipation consists in this, that it was the first great victory over the aristocratic powers of the empire, and was an entrance wedge to the reform of Parliament effected in the next reign. It threw forty or fifty members of the House of Commons into the ranks of opposition to the Tory side, which with a few brief intervals had governed England for a century. The reform movement was the child of Catholic agitation, the anti-corn law league, that of the triumph of reform. Brougham was the legitimate successor of O'Connell. A foresight of such consequences was the real cause of the movement being so bitterly opposed by the King and Lord Eldon. It was not jealousy of the Catholics that moved them. That was only the pretense. It was really fear of the blow aimed against Toryism. They had sagacity enough to see the inevitable result, the advancing power of the Liberal Party and the impossibility of longer ruling the country without ceding privileges to the people. The repeal of the Test Act by the previous administration, which removed the disabilities of dissenters from the established church to hold public office, was only another act in the great drama of national development which was to give ascendancy to the middle class in matters of legislation, rather than to the favored classes who had hitherto ruled. The movement was political and not religious, whatever might be the hatred of the Tories for both Catholics and dissenters. Nothing further of political importance marked the administration of the Duke of Wellington except the increasing agitations for parliamentary reform, which will be hereafter considered. Wellington was elevated to his exalted post from the influence and popularity which followed his military achievements. His fame, like that of General Grant, rests on his military and not on his civil services, although his great experience as a diplomatist and general made him far from contemptible as a statesman it was his misfortune to hold the helm of state in stormy times amid riots agitations insurrections and party dissensions amid famines and public distresses of every kind when england was going through a transition state when there was every shade of opinion among political leaders the duke like canning before him was isolated and felt the need of a friend he was not like a commander-in-chief surrounded with a band of devoted generals but with ministers held together by a rope of sand he had no real colleagues in his cabinet and no party in the house of commons the chief troubles in england were financial rather than political and he had no head for finance like huskinson and sir robert peel in the midst of the difficulties with which the great duke had to contend george the fourth died june twenty sixth eighteen thirty he was in his latter days a great sufferer from the gout and other diseases brought about by the debaucheries of his earlier days and he was a disenchanted man, living long enough to see how frail were the supports on which he had leaned, friends, pleasures, and exalted rank. All authorities are agreed as to the character of George the Fourth, though some in their immeasurable contempt have painted him worse than he really was, like Brougham and Thackeray. All are agreed that he was selfish and pleasure-seeking in his ordinary life, though courteous in his manners and kind to those who shared his revels as dissipated habits obtained the mastery over him and the unbounded flattery of his boon companions stultified his conscience he became heartless and even brutal he was proud and overbearing was fond of pomp and ceremony and ultra conservative in all his political views he was outrageously extravagant and reckless in his expenditures and then appealed to parliament to pay his debts he liked to visit his favorites and received visits from them in return so long as his physical forces remained but when these were hopelessly undermined by self-indulgence he buried himself in his palaces and rarely appeared in public indeed his latter days he shunned the sight of the people altogether his character appears better in his letters than in the verdicts of historians those written to his chancellor eldon to the duke of wellington to lord liverpool to sir william knighton keeper of the privy purse and others show great cordiality frankness and the utter absence of the stiffness and pride incident to his high rank they abound in expressions of kindness and even affection, whether sincere or not. They are all well written and would do credit, from a literary point of view, to any private person. His talents in conversation, his wit and repartee, and his felicitous description of character are undeniable. 
he is said to have had the talent of telling stories to perfection his powers of mimicry were remarkable and he was fond of singing songs at his banquets had he been simply a private person or an ordinary nobleman he would have been far from contemptible the latter days of george the fourth were sad and for a king he was left comparatively alone he had neither wife nor children to lean upon and to cheer him only mercenary courtiers and physicians his tastes were refined his manners affable and his conversation interesting he was intelligent sagacious and well informed yet no english monarch was ever more cordially despised the governing principle of his life was a love of ease and pleasure which made him negligent of his duties and there never yet lived a man however exalted his sphere who had not imperative duties to perform without the performance of which his life was a failure and a reproach so it was with this unhappy king who died like louis the fifteenth without any one to mourn his departure and a new king reigned in his stead and yet the reign of the fourth george as king was marked by returning national prosperity owing not to the efforts of statesmen and legislators but to the marvellous spread of commerce and manufactures resulting from the establishment of peace thus opening a market for british goods in all parts of the world this period of the fourth george's rule as regent and king was also remarkable for the appearance of men of genius in all departments of human thought and action as the lights of a former generation sank beneath the horizon other stars arose of increased brilliancy in poetry alone byron scott rogers coleridge southey wordsworth moore campbell keats would have made the age illustrious a constellation such as has not appeared in fiction sir walter scott introduced a new era soon followed by bulwer dickens and thackeray in the law there were brougham eldon lyndhurst ellenborough denman plunkett erskine wetherall all men of the first class in medicine and surgery were abernathy cooper holland in the church were parr clark hampton scott sumner hall arnold irving chalmers heber waitley newman sir humphrey davy was presiding at the royal society and sir thomas lawrence at the royal academy herschel was discovering planets bell was lecturing at the new london university and dugald stuart in the university of edinburgh captain ross was exploring the northern seas and lander the wilds of africa lancaster was founding a new system of education bentham and ricardo were unraveling the tangled web of political economy hallam lingard mitford mills were writing history macaulay carlyle smith lockhart jeffrey hazlitt were giving a new stimulus to periodical literature while miss edgeworth jane porter mrs hemans were entering the field of literature as critics poets and novelists instead of putting their inspired thoughts into letters as bright women did one hundred years before into everything there were found some to cast their searching glances creating an intellectual activity without previous precedent if we accept the great theological discussions of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries even shopkeepers began to read and think and in their dingy quarters were stirred to discuss their rights while william cobbett aroused a still lower class to political activity by his matchless style all philanthropic educational and religious movements received a wonderful stimulus while improvements in the use of steam mechanical inventions chemical developments and scientific discoveries were rapidly changing the whole material condition of mankind in eighteen twenty when the regent became george the fourth a new era opened in english history most observable in those popular agitations which ushered in reforms under his successor william the fourth these it will be my object to present in another volume authorities crowley's life of george the fourth thackeray's four georges annual register life of the duke of wellington life of canning life of lord liverpool life of lord brougham miss martineau's history of england life of mackintosh life of sir robert peel allison's history of europe life of lord eldon life of o'connell molesworth's history of england end of section fifteen